see it there. Um, I'm a little miffed. I haven't been able to say this to Bill, but uh, there's Dewey the Dugong at the back, and how come he gets to be Kevin Costner? <laughs> I know I'm not that good looking, but, you know, Bill, we'll talk later. But it's good, yeah, we're going for that. Two ideas in this workshop that I'm going to present to you. Um, it's a wicked problem and it's about cancer. And it sits in that area of phrenesis and it sits in that area of praxis. We're going to write up some praxis at the end here. I've been a bit rushed, I know, in what I've presented, but I wanted to get to this point where you understood that you're really going to do something that'll be quite useful here. Is all human life really of equal value? Bit of a rhetorical question, isn't it? That's something to have a think about. Do we really believe in the goals and rules do unto others as you would have them do unto you? I wonder. Could we pass around the jelly babies, please, Anne, the magic jelly babies? Because what I, what I want you to do is to start thinking about human life. I want you to start thinking about what it really means in terms of value. Is the fact that I'm dying of cancer my one life worth more than someone, an infant who's dying of diarrhoea, for example? Is the fact that I'm dying of cancer as a non-smoker mean that my life is worth more than someone who smoked all their lives? <laughs> Would that be fair? Would that be a fair thing? Or are they equal? Or do we treat all, all life as the same? And if we do, do our actions actually mirror that? If we do unto others as we'd have them do unto you, does that transfer from not just those NRM things, but actions in our, in our daily life? I'd like you to think about human life and the way we represent it. You know, when we just give off those glib figures, like 2.3 billion people? They're important figures, aren't they? They, they? they just become numbers that hide things, don't you think? Has everyone got a jelly baby? Because I'll tell you what I'd like you to do. When I, when I want you to think about human life, if we're going to make decisions and I'm suggesting that we, we make some decisions about uh, a wicked problem and it's, it's all about cancer and the way it's being advertised at the present time. I'll explain it in a little bit. I want you to have some feeling and taste of, of what the value of a human life is and what love really is. I'd like to, does it, if you don't like these lollies, well, don't eat them. That's easy. But if you do like these lollies, what I'd like you to do is, is actually in a minute, I'd like you to close your eyes and I'd like you to actually just slowly suck the lolly. And as you suck the lolly, I'd like you to think about someone that you really love. I'd like you to think about someone that you really care for. I'd like to think about someone you died for. I'd like to think about someone that you just would live for. Okay? And I want you to think about that as love. So away we go. Really just be, be going through it because every time you see those those numbers, 2.3 billion, road toll, 1,287. Every time you see things like um, you know, 9,500 people contracted lung cancer last year, um, 7,500 people died of lung cancer last year. Um, you, know, you know one of them, maybe. Uh, you love that person. Uh, there are people in your family that you just so deeply, deeply care for and love. There are people who are your friends that you just care for so much. I want you to think about those people. People with a human life. What's their value of their life compared to some of these other things that are around? It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Love is a beautiful thing. When you see any of those numbers and it says one unit of life, I want you to think about one unit of love. I want you to think about that one unit of how that makes you feel. Okay? It's all right. We can open our eyes whenever we like. Um, but what I'm trying to stress is that sometimes we just use those little, you know, we might use a jelly baby. We might just use a human form, you know, like the, the international little logos, you know, the sorts of ones I mean, don't you? And what I've, what I've found when I started to work 
not just in, 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 in water, but lately in the last 12 months or so, and advocating with, um, with, with, with lung cancer and smokers and non-smokers and who gets the money and where things go, is that some people's lives in Australia are worth much more than others. That's what it gets down to. And I want you to help me work out why. So, every time you see one of those, or you see one of those, just those little uniform things, each one's a real human life. I tried to get um, 2.3 billion and put them on, uh, you know, when I was two won't fit. And it was just a little bit overwhelming for me. So I thought, I'll try and tackle another problem. I'll go to um, the one that I'm enduring at the moment, the fact that 9,500 people in Australia get lung cancer. And it's a wicked problem, and maybe we're not communicating this fact to people and, and, and what we can do about it. Um, and and wake how the diddly, I can't fit 9,500 on there. It's a little bit hard. The 7,500 who die each year, I can't fit on there. The 900 who never, ever smoked, who are classified as having under 100 cigarettes a day, non-smokers, I can't fit 100 on there easily. But each one is a unit of love. Each one is a real person. Have a look at what we've got here. The most lethal cancer in Australia continues to kill more people every year than breast, prostate and ovarian cancer combined, yet receives practically no government funding for research and early detection, detection treatment or care. And the thing is, this has affected me, and it can affect you, it can affect anyone in this room, and everyone in this room are all equally at risk of this. So we can workshop this. All our lives are equal, aren't they? We don't have to worry about those different things. Let's workshop it. Let's look at where the money goes in Australia for this at the present time. Can you read that? Is everyone happy at the moment? Not really. I'm H-A-P-P-Y, I'm H-A-P-P-Y, you know I am, I'm sure I am. No, okay, let's stop it. Okay, let's just go through these and we'll cut to the chase. There's a quiz here and there will be questions asked at the end and people will fail and they'll have to stay back. Okay, so are you ready? I'm going to start prepping you now for the workshop. Workshop beginneth now. What this is, is a breakdown from 2003 to 2005, published in 2008 for... Um, uh, National Audit of Cancer Research in Australia. And it shows the various cancers and um, where they're emanating from. And then over the top in the blue is the identified direct spend um, from government and non-government. Look at the one on the left-hand side that kills most people, lung cancer. You all knew that, didn't you? It kills as many people as breast, prostate, and ovarian cancer combined. But it's not very sexy. It comes with a stigma of having been a smoker or something like that. And the first thing that people ask you is, gee, you must have smoked. You know, and they, they make it um, uh, apparent that they really don't support things for lung cancer as much as they should or could. When you get down to this, you see that the most more common cancers, such as prostate, breast, um, and, um, and colorectal, are, are, are actually... Um, Funded differentially as well. Cancers of unknown primary size don't get, you know, don't get much funding. But when you look at, uh, say, prostate and breast, what you see is a big peak there because they're very, very common. Not as lethal, but they're very, very common. You look down and you see leukaemia, a childhood disease. Well, the sign of a civilised society is it should look after its surroundings and it should look after its young. So you would think, yeah, there should be money for there. But really, when you look at it, why, why is the government spending more money on some than others? These are the workshop numbers, and I'm going to go through them now. There will be a quiz, so if people could actually be writing down about this wicked problem, you're going to help solve this, this afternoon for me. Are we ready? Okay, 9,500. is the number of people that di um, diagnose with lung cancer every year. Write it down, you'll need to remember it. 7,500. Maybe you just want one person at your table to remember things, so you only have to remember one thing each. Talk about it, think about it, so you don't have to do too much work. Okay, 7,500 is the number of people that die every year.
15% of those people who were female never smoked, never had a cigarette in their whole life. Not one. Not one cigarette. But they've got lung cancer. 10% of those people who were male, sorry, 15 of the female, never smoked. 10% of the males, 1 in 10, never smoked, but they've got lung cancer. In the end, in a population of 9,500 people, 1 in 8 have never ever smoked but have got lung cancer. And that's where in that population. The federal government took $6 billion in taxes. Look around your, your table, you might want to get someone to write that one down as well. $6 billion in taxes for um, tobacco last year. In a recent advertising campaign where they said, don't smoke and you won't get lung cancer, full stop, and used all big scary things, um, like images of people coughing um, strawberry jam into uh, handkerchiefs and things like that, 60, uh, they spent $61 million. On actual research into early detection, treatment and cure, they spent $1 million out of the $6 billion. This is the National Health and Medical Research Council figures. On, on appeal, on review of the data that you just were shown, that was raised to $6 million, $2 million of which was not spent on, on research that had anything to do with early detection or it was spent, spent on stigma. And we know there's a stigma. It's what we're going to do about it, about this, this wicked problem about taking things forward, not doing more research, not doing more understanding, but getting into more phrenesis, the sorts of things that I was talking about earlier. So that really sets the scene what's happening in Australia. We've got the most lethal cancer. We're all at risk from it. It's not advertised well at all. If it is, it's advertised as a smoker's disease only. It's not just a smoker's disease. Right? I'm evidence of that. And unfortunately, some of you in this room will also be evidence of that in some way, or someone you know will be evidence of that. Each number represents a real person who is loved. Numbers can obscure emotions, just as emotions can obscure facts. And we've got to know when we're turning the emotions off and turning the emotions on with any of these wicked problems, and how we're actually deciding what we value and how we will understand the values of the society in which we work when we take action. For example, Jill a friend, friend of ours from um, up in Mullaney, was cherished by a friend, taken out by lung cancer. <coughs> Howard is about to become a, well, he got to see his grandson, uh, Jill's brother-in-law, taken out by lung cancer. Alan and Ray, whose relatives are here today, mates in school days, Ray's got a family. Each one of those jelly babies, each unit of love, yeah, there you go, taken out by lung cancer. Alan's wedding photo, his wife, sister and brother also lost to lung cancer. So what I'm saying is that when we look at these wicked problems, they actually have a real human dimension once we start to talk about things that are matters of life and death and there's values squarely come into play. So for this, this workshop that I'm, I'm going to invite you soon to uh, get into, what's happening with this? Do I need to explain the, the scenario just once again? Because what we're going to do is I'm going to ask you in your tables to, to answer a couple of simple questions. The first one is what is happening in terms of uh, your understanding of lung cancer? Now you've seen the statistics and so on. And you've all got it on your table, haven't you? You've all, you've got the, the nocturne. And is this desirable? And we'll give you about five to seven minutes, maybe a bit more, to talk about that. Then we're going to move into um, a what should be done phase. Are people cool with the task? Do people know what needs to be done? Was that a yes? yes. Okay, let's get going. Five minutes, seven minutes, we'll check in. Our, our wonderful table here of uh, deep thinkers came up with a few things. First of all, that we think we should do a medical triage and match the mortality and funding. So where there's high mortality, we should receive high funding. We think that we should 
uh, focus on three things, screening, investigating causes, and advocating that everyone's at risk, not just smokers. Okay, thank you very much, Bill. Anyone else? Come on, don't be shy. Got this table over here. I, I think this table here, Delphine's table, is busting to speak. Yes, I think so too. And this man here looks like just the man. Kate. Uh, we believe uh, there's not enough being done. Uh, there's insufficient research, and we should break, break the nexus uh, with smokers and lung cancer. Okay, people are recording these. Get them down. We're going to go quickly just around the room now. Um, and I know this John Fiend's table. Well, this table had some ideas. We talked a little bit about um, whether lung cancers are primary or secondary, and there's a lot of um, a lot of problems with being able to effectively diagnose where the cancer comes from from the source first off. And lung cancer is often a metastasized cancer, so it's not seen to be sexy to research. There's a bit of a stigma attached um, with lung cancer seeing to be a smoker's problem, but if you go back to Pe Peter's line about every human is created equal and should be valued equally, it shouldn't matter where it comes where it, um, where it comes from, whether it's smoking or non-smoking. Uh, we also raised at the last minute there the same thing about the fact that you need to uh, look at who's getting cancer and prioritise research across um, the numbers. Um, pr and also looked at, talked a little bit about prevention rather than cure. Um, and just uh, anything else? Because if you looked at it, I mean, if you really looked at it and, and you wanted to target, you know, preventative health, we'd, we'd, have, we'd have health fans outside fast food shops going, hey, fatty, <laughs> wouldn't we? Wouldn't we? Or, or we'd be outside the pubs going, cirrhosis of the liver coming your way, cancer of the liver 101, 101, your, your, your meal is ready. You know, we would be. We'd be doing those sorts of things, but we don't. And you know why we don't? because we're all at the pub and we're all at the fast food shop. But if there's people that we can pillory, if we can, have, if we can play the politics of the other, well, we do. It really is something that's, all, that's almost New Testament and here's, here's with that sin, cast the first stone. You know, we're all there. We're all in, because we're all in that one, we leave that one aside and we look for something else. Sorry. Hello. So we also talked about the need for more funding and we talked about how successful some of the other cancers are with fundraising and felt that lung cancer fundraising is obviously inhibited by the stigma that exists at the moment. Most people think that it's caused by smoking. So although in the long term it would be good to have better fundraising in the short term, we'll have to overcome the stigma. So fully support the, I think it's about a third you said of the research budget going towards overcoming that stigma. But the other, other funding opportunity we think that should be changed is that at the moment the funding amount is equivalent to 0.1% of the, the taxes. So it's not even the profit that the tobacco companies are making, that's just the taxes. So surely a much greater percentage of those taxes should be you know, directed towards, towards the research. Thanks. Oh, right, Vigga. Something comes out for me in what you're saying and it's just... It's just these two words in terms of the advertising, in terms of where the funding goes. And we've decided, somehow our government has decided that the life of someone who doesn't smoke and gets lung cancer is not equal to the life of someone who smokes or something like that, something bizarre. There's a government policy thing at risk here or, or at issue here. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay, sorry, let's continue on. But <coughs> I think that's going to be a big one. Okay. Any more takers? Yeah. Oh, just sorry, over here. <laughs> um, a couple of things in what's happening. The graph doesn't actually show, Peter, um, the values attached uh, to those various allocations of, um, of funding. And that's very important because... In terms of actual money... Yeah, it, th there are no values attached to those, and that's very important because, you as you know, scientists and doctors don't talk about values when it comes to medicine. Um, it was interesting, if I might very quickly say, that uh, recently my father, who's 95, had a stent 
uh, operation proposed. And the doctor asked him, how long do you want to live, Mr. Berry? And he said, oh, well, four or five years. And so they decided to do it. And I asked the surgeon, why did you um, ask him that question? It seemed a very unusual question for a doctor. He said, well, it's quite practical, really. A lot of people don't care about living much longer. And, um, and so why would we bother operating on, a, you know, doing an expensive operation on mm. somebody who decides to not care yeah. whether they live or die? And what I'm saying is that what you're seeing there is um, in terms of the amount spent um, on, say, breast cancer, prostate cancer, is apart from the fact that it's popular and it's, it's, it's high profile, there is no division between the smoker and the non-smoker, as we've said. There's no, um, uh, and, and for us over here anyway, that was one of the things we wanted to, to yeah. suggest, that uh, we need to relate those tobacco taxes um, uh, to research into, into the non-smoker. In, in other words, what's the difference between lung cancer with the smoker and lung cancer uh, with the non-smoker? Yeah. Um, the other thing that we felt in terms of what's happening is that we really don't have enough information. For example, is Australia um, judging the amount it spends on, on research into cancer on what the rest of the world is doing? Is America spending a huge amount on cancer research so that the NHMRC says, look, why should we be spending too well, much? Yeah, universal, uh, we're, we're behind the eight ball around the globe. All right, for this as, as, as a disease, in terms of funding, um, the stigma issues apply in all developed countries. Um, they didn't need to be re -re researched here, um, and when it comes down to how long people might decide that they'd like to live, well, I'd like to live quite a while. You know, so would we all, I think. Um, so sometimes, you know, people are old and they make those decisions, but. I don't think I don't think that that's actually just what we're just what I've put this up about. The fact is that if you get um, breast, prostate, or ovarian cancer, the government will spend about eight times as much um, in, in national health and medical research dollars as it will have spent on you if you were an individual with lung cancer, whether you gave it to yourself or not. Okay. So anyway. Just some feedback. Sarah? At our, at our table, we, um, we just started brainstorming words to start with, so when we were talking about what is happening, um, I censored the first one because the first one was sweet FA. And then after that, we the brainstormed discrimination, um, assumptions and stigma and, and ignorance, and that being fed uh, by media, fueling uh, this... Uh, these ideals, I guess, by uh, misinformation and or a lack of awareness, and that being driven by a lack of knowledge as reflected by the figures of the, the six million into media versus uh, the one million in research. And then we sort of asked, well, we obviously said that uh, this isn't acceptable, definitely not. not. Um, so what needs to be done? And we were talking about time, time and, and, and increased knowledge and perhaps having to shift our focus um, a little bit in Australia because uh, one of our international uh, students raised the fact that in um, many other countries perhaps not as many people actually don't smoke and Australia is a wonderful place to be where you can go to many public places now where people don't smoke and if lung cancer is still going to be an issue without smoking then perhaps there needs to be a shift in focus with the funding. Yeah, because actually what you get when you divide it up in the population 900 people who were non-smokers, never smokers, smoked under 100 cigarettes in their whole life, um, will die from lung cancer next year in Australia. Now the road toll was only 1,287 last year, but we spend a hell of a lot of concern on the road toll. We're all at risk of it, but we don't spend much money on this one. Um, and we know people, well, there are people in their early 20s that are, that are dying of idiopathic lung cancer, lung cancer no known cause. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big one that can affect us all. And it's as common as the road toll. So what I'm, I'm going to suggest, Brian and, and, and Paul, with your forbearance, is that we continue on and we get to the point where we're actually really looking at 
what's to be done. Now, I know you're all smart people, strategic, measurable, you're going to do things that are achievable, realistic and targeted when you write out any sort of action, what's to be done. You're not just going to write down, they should do something about it. You're actually going to identify some actors, you're going to identify what it is that they've actually got to do, you're going to identify what, how you'll know it's achieved, you've got to identify how that it's realistic, you know, um, that, it, that, it, that it can be done, that the resources are there and that it's quite targeted, you can measure it later on. And what I want you to do is write those up in your neatest hand and we're going to put them up on the wall and then we're going to get people to circulate and have a quick look at those and a discussion on those. Okay, so are we ready to go? Does that sound like a good way forward? I hope so because that's the third question. Let's go. Are we ready to go? Okay, take a lead, take a lead. Let's go. Okay, so we've got loads of great ideas. In fact, so many ideas that we can't fit them on the boards. What I'd like to do um, is hey, ask Jeremy. for, for, right, for one right. group. Can I ask for somebody from, from this table just to say what's to be done? Okay, folks, Brian will need your attention here. I think we need to focus the energy just here. And I, I'm only small with a small voice and an accent that you won't understand. Okay, so we've got a, a group here uh, who's going to tell us what should be done. Some great ideas. Well, I'm Susie and I'm smaller, so... Uh, <laughs> but I've got a microphone now. Um, this is um, our table focused on the ta tobacco tax. We were pretty cranky that the money isn't getting thrown back into research. Where is it going? The question needs to be asked at a state and federal level. The question needs to be asked to our health ministers and treasurers at state and federal level and to advocacy groups because a lot of us don't feel equipped to ask the questions and so there needs to be, uh, the health advocacy groups really need to step in and ask these questions. We need to ask our local members, where is this tobacco tax going? Um, from what I gather, Pete, in Queensland, it's a lot lower um, return to the, to the uh, research than other states. Is that right? The Queensland government gets no, collects no tobacco tax, so it gives nothing out. Gives nothing and out. It's got uh, three or four fellowships that it gives out, and a few other bits and pieces. And um, and then we got down to some uh, deeper personal ways of getting involved. Um, certainly, removing the blame and judgment at a personal level, and uh, through social media to influence others about understanding the variety of causes and and. Where, that fu where those funds are going to, asking those questions at the deeper personal level. Uh, weekly magazines, the big five, Women's Day, Women's Weekly, uh, That's Life, Take Five, a new idea like Jane McGrath's breast cancer promotion happened. Uh, we need to get to that level. The other um, Australian story, I gather Michael Berry might be thinking about that at the moment. That would be a really great way of getting that out with Peter's story. And uh, to find charismatic a charismatic person to promote it would be great, but certainly to ask those questions at every level. That's great. Thank you very much. Give Susie a clap. <laughs> and of course the rest of her, her table. Um, Paul, is there a, a group on your side? Yes, my name's Linda and I'm the wife of Ray. We were talking about, at our table, talking about the same um, needs for tobacco companies to, um, to get that excise tax back into um, some form so that it can be used for research, etc. However, we said, why don't we approach the tobacco companies straight out and say, hey, we realise that, yes, tobacco does, uh, smoking does affect and does have some effect on lung cancer, but also it doesn't um, in, in some instances. And um, we would like you to put your money straight into research to help us um, get a better profile and to um, also do a few other things that Bev's going to talk about. The other thing is the national um, advertising campaign did nothing to reduce the stigma um, with cancer sufferers, lung cancer sufferers, especially uh, when they depicted a smoker all the time. So if we're going to have anything happen there, we need to get that changed. 
So we need to be um, advocating for um, a better advertising program to make sure that it encompasses everybody, not just smokers. And you, Linda? I'm Beverly, friends of Peter and Anne's from Mullaney, um, and my husband Al and Ray were in school together, grew up as little ones, and they both lost their battle within about six months of each other. Um, my Al was just a few months ago. But I also had my brother and sister, one early 40s, the other early 50s. They died of lung cancer. They were both smokers, and we honestly believed that it would never happen to us. And I had said that many times won't happen to us, we're not smokers. So therefore, we've got to do something about that stigma and that education. Um, we've got to educate the medical profession. Um, when my husband, Alan, was, went along to the doctor, he lost weight, he had the cough, the doctor sent him for a chest X-ray. Uh, the X-ray ca came back, it said, fine. I've since found out that on a general chest X-ray, Stage one and stage two lung cancers are rarely picked up. Stage three and stage four, it will. A scan would have done it, uh, would most probably have picked it up. Um, st stage one, he would have had a 50-50 chance. Stage three, he would have had a five chance. Stage four, it's palliative care. So we must educate our doctors as well um, with that. Um, and as well as that, um, I feel it's very hard to get up and speak, but I feel amongst ourselves we must become more aware if we're not happy. If we don't feel things are right, then we must ask for another opinion and do something. We must be responsible. We must talk to our friends about this because when you see that, that huge, huge line up there, it affects so many. So we must make our friends and family... If you've got someone who's not just real well, get them to check it out every avenue. Um, and Peter and Anne, Peter, you've done a marvellous job um, in this last few weeks. Um, I just wish we could do heaps more from here on. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Bev and, and Linda. Look, can I just say what, one reason there's not much advocacy for lung cancer is because lung cancer patients don't live very long. My prognosis was 10 months. I've lived 30. All right? So, and for about the first 18 months, I probably couldn't talk about it because I'd just collapse in tears. All right? Couldn't really talk about it publicly. So you've got to get to the point where you've got some inner strength where you can actually communicate about these things. Um, and... There's another thing I want to talk about that you really can do right now. Everybody's heard of the McEwen Review? No, nobody's heard of it. If you get on your portable devices at the present time and Google McEwen Review, you will find that there's a man, Simon McEwen, and he's leading a major review for all health and medical research in Australia for the next decade. A billion dollar plus sort of activity, NH and MRC and so on. Now, if you go to down in that review and you look for media releases, and you click on it, you will find that there aren't any because it's being done in secret. Oh, no, it's not being done in secret. Um, it's just that they thought they'd tell people about it at the start, and they'll tell people about it when they finish doing their work, and that'll be about it, and they'll ask for feedback then. Does it sound like any other wicked problem we've heard of before? Yeah, it sounds a little bit like it. Same sort of thinking. Get a lot of data. There's public meetings, and you'll find that they've held public meetings, but when you go then on the site and you look for who has actually gone to the public meeting, there's 297 things from, uh, submissions from researchers, and there's three from patients. Bit weird, eh? The voice of the patient, the, the, the thing that I really struggle for in education, that, the, that people should be empowered that we don't live very long, that our relatives have to carry on. That's what, you know, that's crazy. That's crazy stuff. But there we are with the McEwen Review being done in silent. And when I've actually rung up people on the committee and said, what's the go? Why haven't you issued any media releases? That's exactly what they've told me. They've just said, well, we just, you know, we'll get to it at the end when we've decided what the best recommendations are. So do yourself a favour. If you're interested in this sort of thing, and many of us... Uh, you know, 
Please have a look at that site. Sorry, I took over fairly and unsquarely. Um, how are we going? Would you like to hear a song? I'll see if I can go. I don't even know if I can remember this song, um, but I'm going to try. This is a song I used to sing the last four years to um, uh, our integrated water management students. It's called From the Ranks to the Sea. Six weeks ago, I couldn't make my left hand and my right hand work together, so we'll see how they go today. I was waiting for the storms to come, patient for the rain. Really needs the fish shell catch, we all need the same. But dark, muddy creeks, oh little light, there are droughts on land and sea. Clean creeks, green seagrass meadows, and here he'll always be. So waiting for the storms to come, patient with the rain. Really needs the crops he's sown, we all need the same. It's hard to keep on pleasing people, pulling on your sleeve. Land and water to grow forever, and he will never leave. From the rains to the sea, let the creeks flow free. Water joins you and me. From rains to sea, keep us hands on the land, help us understand that so many strands. John Sea and Land. She's waiting for the storms to come. Patient with the rain. Auntie knows good water joins good land. May we all know the same. Oh, it's hard to help some people feel the things she clearly sees. Water joins us all many ways and joins the land and sea from the rains to the sea let the creeks flow free water joins you and me from rains to sea keep wise hands on the land help us understand that so many strands join sea Strong wings reel, they ride high skies now. Summer storms seldom lie. Land and sea are joined to sky. All hearts and hands, all people's dreams now. The storm clouds smile and weep. The lullabies of tin roof rain songs lead me to my sleep. From the rain to the sea, let the creeks flow free. Water joins you and me from range to sea. So that had nothing to do with lung cancer. But, um, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get back into this topic in, in just a second. We might finish on a bit of good convivial dugong rock with us all going for it. But um, what, I, what I'm pleased to be hearing is that some of these things are really targeted and that maybe we can do some things about it. Some of this does seem to me to come back to government policy, doesn't it? And what we're, what we're looking at and government's ideas and what they can do and they can't do. So that's an important thing. And going back to that song, um, it talks about links in the land and the sea. The first verse I, I actually sang about um, a man called Anthony Heilig who's on Hussey Creek and a farmer there. The second verse is unashamedly about Mr Greg Savage. Um, 
And the third verse is about um, uh, a traditional owner of this area, the daughters in the, in, in, in the room here today, Auntie. Um, and I pay my respects to her. So that's what that song was about. Um, but let's get back to lung cancer. What, what other sorts of um, things are going on, Brian, Paul, with, with our, our bits and pieces in terms of this third question? Are Brian and Paul still in the room? Hello, Brian, okay. it looks like it's me. I think Brian's uh, done the he was yeah. Okay, we've got some other different ones. Yes, I think we probably do. I'd, I'd like to, I know Peter's a very hard act to follow, but I'd, I'd like to ask somebody from this group. This might be a bit left field, but go with me. I think there's discrimination and inequalities in the funding, but I think um, we probably need to motivate smokers who are alive and haven't got lung cancer to lobby government to spend some money on a potential issue that they, they may suffer. And I read an article recently where a smoker, 75% of the money that he pays for his habit goes in taxes. He also pays health insurance, this fellow, and he felt discriminated against. And his life is of equal value to anyone. So I think some sort of a, a some sort of empowerment or some sort of campaign by the Lung Foundation to get smokers to lobby government to use cigarette packet advertising with one line, one line has seemed to be the way to go with advertising, that uh, about where their taxes are going, where they're not going, what their life expectancy is from cancer, lung cancer, and that sort of thing. And in a way, that may also encourage those smokers to a bit of one-liner short statistics about lung cancer may motivate them to give up smoking. We captured that, Tim? We got that up here? That's good. That's my brother, Tim. We'll do one more from your side, Paul, and then I, I think Mark has some, some concluding remarks. Okay, uh, I'm Declan. I'm one of the current master students. Declan. From our table, I'll just give one of our, our recommended actions, which is um, along with the advocacy campaign, when you're going to try and influence decision makers, you need to make a request that seems achievable. So we felt targeting the current tobacco tax of six billion, uh, requesting 1% of that would give about 60 million a year for lung cancer research. Okay. So just targeting 1% of the current six billion tax would be something that seems achievable. And it's a good target to focus on. Thank you. Okay, Mark. Peter, did you promise Jig on Mark as well? Yeah. Okay. So am am I allowed? Sorry? Am I allowed? Yeah, yeah. yes, okay. please. Um, yeah, so th these, these are uh, uh, concluding remarks. It's a, it's a shame to have to stop this afternoon, but but indeed, I'm sure we'll enjoy being outside and having a, having a cup of tea with with Peter. Um, but but in in concluding this afternoon, uh, there's there's a there's a number of things that I could say. I'm, I'm not going to talk for long. Um, but one of the things that uh, was written first on our pieces of butcher's paper over there in that workshop just now uh, was was the need to have uh, champions. Um, I think you'd all agree that um, we've, we've got a friend here who's a champion of many things. Um, 
Just a side note, Peter, it's a retirement lecture, and I'm Peter's boss, by the way. <laughs> uh, I need to talk about uh, that pay rise. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but but I, I don't seem to have received any notification about retirement, so... I still have a few little things to do yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah quite. I'm, I'm expecting timesheets rather than... Uh, r rather I, told than uh, you, I told you I was on leave for two weeks and I'd get back to it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, in fact, the, the, the last thing that I'd uh, want, want to think of is this is, is perhaps as a retirement lecture, but uh, uh, I think you'd all agree that we learned a bit uh, today. I know I did. I always learned something uh, from Peter, even when he's got me in, where was that, Hui An, doing the kangaroo hop <laughs> with a it bunch of 24, 24 participants. Uh, 24 people from half a dozen countries around Southeast Asia. It's amazing how quickly Peter can get a group like that. Uh, I don't know, it was 24 people, must have been from seven or eight countries. Uh, they're all doing the kangaroo hop. Uh, uh, Im impressive um, person, and I've, uh, I've enjoyed knowing Peter for a long time and then really enjoyed, as you might imagine, working with him for the last uh, five years. Um, uh, I, I do want to thank uh, thank the, the people who, who put this together. Uh, cl clearly, uh, that's perhaps less significant than what Peter's been through. I think, uh, even in the last few weeks, getting his head around doing this thing, uh, and and I thank you a lot for that, Peter. But I thank others who who've been part of the organisation. Um, uh, the, 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 other, the other people I ne that I really want to thank is, is, is all of you for being here. Uh, as, as you know, we, we, had to, we had to change the venue. It seems this guy, Peter Oliver, is fairly popular. Uh, so, so thank you very much uh, for being here and sharing this, uh, this afternoon with us and with, with Peter and his family and friends. Uh, and uh, I think it's just fantastic that there was actually... How many were in the bus, Peter? Oh, I lost count. Lost count. You, you picked 40. up anyone on the way? Yeah. So, uh, I'm not sure if you all know, but the, the, the Mulaney mob came down from the mountain by bus. Uh, uh, so wonderful. maybe there may, be, there, there may be some partying on the way back, I hope so. Thank you to IWC for helping with that. <laughs> um, look, thanks again, everyone, but uh, please uh, join with me in thanking yourselves for being here, but thanking... Uh, Peter uh, for his uh, his contribution uh, to en en environment uh, and water management, uh, his unique style, uh, and indeed thank him for the advocacy that he's now um, playing out uh, on, on behalf of of his himself and his fellow and future uh, lung cancer sufferers. So thanks very much, everybody. <laughs> And uh, only Peter can do the next bit. But after that, uh, as I've already indicated, there's uh, we can have a cup of tea outside and let's keep talking. What a great way to spend a Thursday afternoon, hey? Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for coming, and thanks for your input here, because we'll use these things. Um, I've tried for a few weeks to actually get um, an audience by the conventional means with our new Minister for Health and, and was after a few weeks was just sort of getting there, you know. And, and then there was um, a lady who's, who's in this room, Mrs Margaret Thompson, and she, she heard an interview that I did somewhere else or she saw something in a newspaper and she said, I'll send something to set, um, 6124QR. And it finished up that I got this interview um, with Steve Austin. Within half an hour of going to air with Steve Austin about the sorts of things that I've been talking about here, I had our local member saying the Minister for Health will talk with you for half an hour um, individually about what's going on. Um, and that was uh, interesting. As a result of that, I now have Professor Robin Mortimer, who's the Head of Strategic Research for Queensland Health, helping us with Cabinet submissions for some of the things that you're talking about here. They're not things that are necessarily going to cost a lot of money, but will be about 
ethics and evidence-based advertising for health issues. Okay, that's what we'll be putting up to Cabinet. But there are lots of other things here and when you're thinking about that McEwen review, I suggest that you, you know, um, just have a look on that site because it's just weird that people would still continue to do things like that. If they did that in the Master of Integrated Water Management course, what would we give them? A solid fail. Hey, we tell them to go back. Now, let's, let's conclude this with a very important song. Oh, hang on. I've got to get the, I've got to get the packet of Marlborough somewhere. But there it is. There it is, Mum. All right, you got it? Okay. And, and someone, I think it was someone, I can't remember who it was, said, but that's not real, is it? That's not real. And they said, that must have hurt. And I thought, well, not really. <laughs> Enough for what we've been having. So here we go. Jigong Rock, we've got to immortalise it. Okay. I'm Doug, I'm a Jigong and I live in the bay. For years out there it's been okay. Right, hang on, let's stop the tick, stop the tick. I'm just thinking that's going to get very loud and we might need to get people in a second just to stand up because there's some actions. <laughs> I, I've forgotten the actions. But just watch this for a start. Just watch for a start. If you sit down, then you'll see the actions. When you get to the chorus, it goes, put your left hand high up in the air, shake that seagrass from your hair. That'll be no problem for me. Put your right hand down low, feel the sand. Move your little tail to the dugong band. Roll to the left, roll to the right. You're really going to boogie tonight. Let's get down and do the dugong rock. Easy, hey. So let's just have, let's just have a little clapping. Okay, and we go one. Two, I'm Doug, I'm a Jugong and I live in the bay. For years out there it's been okay. You really gotta dig that Jugong scene. We eat seagrass, sweet and green. But the water's growing muddy, the light is dim. There's not much seagrass, the future's grim. And all I wanna do is the Jugong rock. The Jugong rock. Put your left hand high up in the air. Shake that seagrass from your hair. Put your right hand down, no fear of sand. Move your little tail to the dugong band. Roll to the left, yeah, roll to the right. We're really gonna boogie tonight. We're really gonna do the dugong rock. The dugong rock. What would you gong all real laid back dudes? But messing up the meadows is really rude. From the country to the city, come feel the beat. Keep the creek waters clean and sweet. We cruise from Redlands to Pumice Stone. We we'll sing a deep boogie when we're all alone. Let's get down and do the Jugong Rock. The Jugong Rock. Here we last time. Put your left hand high up in the air. Shake that seagrass from your hair. Put your right hand down low, feel the sand. Move your little tail to the Jugong Band. Roll to the left, roll to the right. We're really gonna boogie tonight. We're really gonna do the Jugong Rock. The Jugong Rock. The Jugong Rock. Thank you. You make them all. <laughs> All right, there's afternoon tea to be had. Thank you for coming. Thank you for all who sponsored and participated. And watch out, it's coming to a shop soon near you.